name is Pepe Julian Ozima. I am the <coughs> Programs Director at SMAG, Sexual Minorities Uganda. I'm going to be your moderator today. And um, I'm happy that you honored our invitation and have kept good time. We're supposed to start at nine. We're about seven minutes after nine. Um, the other people who said they would be here will find us you know, in, in action. So I thank you very much that you honored our invitation to launch a report that we've been working on for a period of time. And as you can see up there, the title of the report is And That Is How I Survived Being Killed which is a direct quote from one of the participants or one of the people who was interviewed during this research. The research team is here and they will be giving us an overview and in-depth a presentation about the report. There's also another um, piece of publication that we will be bringing to your attention. It's a handbook, a passport called Know Your Rights. It's also something that we'll be able to you know, to enable you know your own rights and how to be responsible for those rights. And before we go into the first presentation, I want to recognize the presence of the country director of OCHA, UN uh, High Commission, Dr. Uchena, right at the back. Thank you so much for always honoring our invitations. Uh, Mr. Hassan Shire, with a colorful hat behind there. Thank the media in the house. Thank you very much for, you know, also honoring our invitation. The media, there's a section that also talks about that in our report. So it's good to see that the media actually, you know, honored our invitation because there's a lot going on in this country and we're usually at the bottom of the, what should I call it, the, the news chain or the food chain when it comes to any form of uh, representation. Um, my executive director is also here, Dr. Frank Mukisha. All partners, thank you, thank you so much. And because time is not our best ally, I'll directly ask, I don't say straight, <laughs> I'll directly ask uh, our safety and protection officer, Council Douglas Mawadri, to present to us about the Know Your Rights um, booklet. Douglas. And as Douglas is coming here, uh, we are live on social media, on Twitter. If you're on Facebook, uh, search for Sexual Minorities Uganda, SMAG, dash SMAG. And then on Twitter, we are at CAPS, S-M-U-G, 2004. And the hashtag we are using today is SMAG Report 2016. And the other alternative one is how I survived. Those are the two hashtags we're using today. I think we have internet around. Any of you who is, you know, on social media, upload us, let people know about us. And uh, th th there's some coupons from the hotel 
for Wi-Fi that you can get with the admin at the back. Welcome, Douglas. Uh, thank you, uh, Pepe, the moderator. And good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Douglas Mawadri. Um, I work with uh, Sexual Minorities Uganda um, in the Department of Safety and Protection. And I am the Safety and Protection Officer at SMAG. Um, I, but my, my, my task is really very simple one, to, to uh, give a, a, a very brief background about a book called, uh, a handbook called Human, uh, Human Rights Know Your Rights Handbook. And this handbook has actually been, uh, has, has come in, um, in, in, in light with uh, our work at SMAG and the gaps we have identified with the work at SMAG and the knowledge of people in respect to how far they they, they, they have knowledge in human rights. So, if they, um, in, 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 in part of that, we realized that there was need for us to come up with a very simple, simplified and abrogated uh, version, a bridge version rather, of the constitution. And here we, to, we, we, we talk about the Bill of Rights, a few uh, articles in the Bill of Rights that actually we thought in our view that it's quite important and we should bring it to the view of, of um, our constituents. And uh, this is in respect to the fact that uh, as an organization and as a civil society organization, we have an obligation to give knowledge to our members in the community. And as uh, concerned citizens, we thought in our wisdom that it's important to come up with a very simple, simplified version of, this, uh, of the position where we explain and break down the knowledge so that people know what to do at what material time whenever they are arrested or whenever they are faced with the law. And uh, of course we know for a fact that uh, not each and every person knows so much about the law in Uganda. And in within the LGBT community and outside the civil society organizations, we have lots of work to do around rights. So many uh, people know uh, rights, but whether or not we put this in practice is, is, is another question. So um, this book actually explains um, very brief rights. It, it breaks down uh, am I audible now? Yes. Okay. It, 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 it breaks down um, an analysis of, of, of rights and it, it also further gives uh, an understanding of what particular rights uh, we are talking about here. So um, that's actually the very the, the, the background of the book. And 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 uh, also um, we 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 have an obligation of of promoting um, awareness of the law to our constituents as as um, as an organisation. And, and also, um, one of, as one of, one of the core uh, mandates of SMAG, to give capacity building for its members. So we thought that this book, again, will give capacities for people to do uh, activism and to also know their rights whenever they are arrested and also to know who to respond to at, at, at any material time. Uh, so the, the, the book has uh, some segments. And the very first segment is uh, we're talking about the Bill of Rights. And in the Bill of Rights, we have considered very few uh, articles in the Constitution. And the very first one is um, the fundamental and other human rights and freedoms in the Constitution. That's under Article 20. Here, we're talking about what fundamental rights and freedoms people, people, people should know. What, what um, um, rights do people have? And how do these rights come about? Is it a right that is given by the Constitution or it's a right that is and um, uh, obliged to a person by the fact that he is a human being and it should be a right that should be entitled to that person because of the fact that he is a human being. So uh, uh, that's the very first segment. The, se the second segment is about equality and freedom from a fundamental and freedom from discrimination rather, where it talks about all persons being equal before and under the law. And this should not take, the, take away the fact that <laughs> LGBT persons are also um, entitled to each and every uh, rights as opposed to uh, as as any other person in the community. You may realize that when people come out and uh, come out and declare that they are LGBT persons, 
some people's rights are they, they are, they are strickled. Some people think that LGBT rights should not, rather uh, LGBT persons should not be given some rights. So we are saying in this book that LGBT persons also have right just like any other person. And for that matter, they should also be viewed to be equal with any other person and they should not be discriminated in, in, the, in, in, in service provision. So they should be seen as any other human being, being within the community. And in any case, if they're faced with the law, they should, they should, be, they should not be discriminated in any way. Um, we are talk, we are, there, there's a segment that talks about respect for human dignity and protection from inhuman treatment. You may realize that um, issues of dignity of persons are quite important. If someone has been arrested and the person is tortured, the person is treated inhumanly, the person is treated with uh, cruelty, and if, in, in respect of, of obtaining information from this person, this person is tortured. So it may realize that people actually lose dignity in the fact that of, of, of the fact that they are being uh, considered as LGBT person, they're not considered to be having some of these rights. So we're saying that yes, you have these rights. Yes, by the fact that if and if you are an LGBT person, you should not be treated. Uh, you should not be punished. You should not be treated with. Uh, uh, you should not be tortured. You should not be um, co considered as someone who who falls outside um, the the mandates of the law. So. This book says that LGBT persons also have, uh, they should be considered with dignity when, 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 when faced with the law. Um, there is a segment that talks about the privacy of persons, persons, uh, homes, and any other <coughs> property. What, what is privacy here? You know, and at what material time can your privacy be taken away by the law? So, um, LGBT persons and any other person in the community also should be given the right to privacy. And in event, if you are searched, is the person searching you having lawful documentation for, for the search? Does the person just uh, wake up and you know start uh, searching and, and finding out any materials, materials from you that actually incriminates you? Because mostly in searching, that's what people are looking for. Any other material that would otherwise be used as like a right to know who is searching them, they have a right um, uh, to, to record each and every single material that is found in, the, in their position that will be used against them. Because in such a what happened is that at times people deliberately come with any other uh, uh, objects that will be planted and eventually it will be used against you. So whichever material obtained against or found in your possession, you should know and take, uh, take note of that so that in any case, if any other person uh, smuggles in any material, you know that this material actually does not fall within you at the time when you're being searched. And also things to do with whether or not there's any other person who would actually be there at the time when you're searched. That would actually give you um, an, 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 uh, an extra protection that yes, some other person watched at the time when you're being searched and you don't have uh, that material evidence at the time of the search. Um, right to a fair hearing. Right to a fair hearing uh, before an impartial judiciary. And an impartial judiciary that they, they, should, they should not have determined your case even before you appear before the, before, before, the, before the judiciary or before the tribunal or before any other person or authority that is trying you. So we are saying that LGBT person, just like any other person, has a right to a fair hearing and they, they sh in, in, at, at the time of hearing, they should be given all uh, the relevant materials to examine witnesses and um, to appear before a, a judge that is just and impartial and that actually can be able to deliver um, uh, uh, judgment on a fair ground, not necessarily uh, having a predetermined um, uh, a case before this person because of the fact that this person probably uh, identifies as an LGBT person and for that matter the person may not necessarily be given a fair hearing in that respect. Um, also, uh, this booklet also explains the right of expression and assembly in societies. 
You may realize that LGBT persons uh, and organizations have existed <laughs> in Uganda for a very long time. Over the years, organizations have come up, organizations have tried to form, and people have tried to form associations and formally express <coughs> themselves, um, and eventually also have formed associations. But these associations are not legally registered. People have been operating under the, under the radars. Um, and and underground and there's no formal organization that has come out. So we are saying that this book gives people's right to expression, gives people's right to assembly as long as when you organize and you have most informed authorities to express yourself and eventually form associations. And these associations can be registered under the law and work formally and legally so that you you you, you don't hide your activities for as long as when your activities are geared towards promoting um, human rights and as a also um, further furthering a, a civil obligation uh, of of of, of um, educating your members about their particular rights. Um, the, uh, the, the 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 heart of this book then comes into the common and the frequent uh, incidents that is always reported by LGBT persons, and also as organisation that works in protecting LGBT persons and human rights organisations, we are talking about and thinking about our day-to-day -day activities, what do LGBT persons face in day-to-day -day activities, in day-to-day -day life and livelihood? There are arrests and detentions, there are blackmails, there are media intrusions where people are exposed um, to, to, to third parties um, against their will. They don't give a consent <coughs> by the media to, 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 to expose them. And the fact that whenever someone is exposed to the media, the person faces so many um, uh, incidents that ranging from arrest and detention, um, ranging to blackmail and, and extortion and 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 other uh, um, uh, and and, uh, and other uh, inhuman um, infringements of their rights. So, as people f people are faced, uh, uh, precisely LGBT people people are faced with these um, incidents. Who do they report to? How do they act at the time when, when they are uh, arrested or detained? Um, who, who, um, how should they, you know, how should they, how, how, who should they inform at the time of arrest? Um, um, also, when, when they are faced with uh, employment uh, terminations, because also when people are expressed, uh, sorry, when people are, um, are outed into the media, you find that they, uh, they, they get terminated from their employment. So whom do they have to um, report to? How, 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 do, um, how, how should they act at that time until when probably their, their cases are solved amicably? Or um, as, as, as they go about with it. So this explains where to go to and, and, and whom they should, they should uh, report their cases to, this eventually gives them a right for channel to follow up their case as, um, as, as, as they go about with finding um, a resolution to, uh, a resolution and, and a remedy to their, to their cases. And last but not least, there is a, an emergency response, uh, response contact for um, the legal aid service providers that, uh, providers that uh, SMAG has worked with. And these are uh, uh, organizations that actually give uh, legal aid services for free. And uh, also, there are organizations that actually do provide legal aid services, but they provide them on instructions of, um, of, of SMAG. So, for as much as we work to give uh, legal aid services, we should also let people to know that there are also other service, legal aid service providers that, that, that they can go to in case of emergencies and they can always call and they get responded to. So that book precisely talks about um, all what uh, I had listed um, in, in my presentation. So thanks so much. And that is it for my <laughs> Thank you very much, Douglas for that um, overview of the handbook that we'll be receiving at the end. Um, they'll be launched together with, uh, with the main report of the day. Um,
Richard. So the research team is now going to present to you the report. And um, for your questions, just keep them somewhere at the end of their presentation will be able to interact with the researchers. So let me invite uh, Mr. Richard Lusimbo, who is our research and documentation uh, team leader. Richard. And Austin Bryan, who is our research and documentation uh, assistant slash intern. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Pepe, Programs Director, uh, our, our Chief Guest, the ED, and everyone protocol observer. Uh, before myself and Brian speak, uh, I want to say that the work we're presenting today, we did not do it alone as people were standing here, but it was a team uh, of uh, researchers, whom under our, our team we call them reactors. So I'm going to request all the reactors to stand up for recognition. Uh, I can see Isaac, uh, please stand up for recognition. Isaac is from Spectrum Uganda. Uh, I see uh, Brant Swata from Icebreakers Uganda. Uh, Tom from Spectrum. Bob Buana from Icebreakers, Douglas Mawadri, um, and uh, our other reactors are in Barara, but they couldn't make it for today, but we shall also be in Barara speaking and sharing with them, so they send their apologies. Uh, this morning, we're going to take you, or we're going to give you an overview of what the actual report is looking like or what is in the actual report. So myself and Austin here, we are going to take you through that. The title of the report is, and that's how I survived being killed. And as you'll see, the copy of the report also has testimonies of human rights abuses from sexual minorities, from Uganda sexual and gender minorities. So we, as uh, our programs director had mentioned, the title is an actual quote from a person that we talked to whose rights were violated. Our introduction, <coughs> we, even after the annulment of the Anti-Homosexuality Act, human rights abuses against LGBT persons have pursued the other is based on first hand testimonies. This report documents uh, the continued human rights abuses in Uganda. And the report also includes 264 verified cases of persecution of LGBT individuals based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. I also want to put to attention that the documentation for this report uh, started in the month of May 2014 and we concluded our research on the 31st of December, 2015. We have continued to see that even when the law, the anti-homosexual law is nullified, our government agents and the community at large continues to use section 145, uh, where we see arrest, harassment, torture of sexual and gender minorities in Uganda. What is at stake? the right to equality, freedom uh, from discrimination continues to be violated every day for gender and minorities. The right to protection to life. We continue to see that LGBTI people are denied that. The right from depression or property. We see LGBTI people losing their identified or look differently. 
The protection of freedom of conscience, expression, movement, religion, assembly and association. This continues to be violated. And as our protection, safety and protection mentioned, we have seen that even organizations that try to work for the rights of our sexual minorities are even not given an opportunity to register. Or even the way they do their work, it's under hardship. The right to human dignity and protection from inhuman treatment. This is denied from LGBTI people. When they are arrested, they are paraded before the media. They are undressed before the media. And that's right, just because someone loves or is different from what the society thinks they should be. The right to privacy of persons, home and property. We have or we have documented cases whereby people's phones have, have been checked, computers, uh, people's homes have been broken into, and their privacy has been lost. The methodology. Just as I had mentioned, we started collecting this information from May 2014 to December last year. We conducted interviews with 115 individuals um, after getting consent from the different persons that we talked to and a form of consent was signed allowing us to go ahead with uh, the research but also to use some of the information that is not self-identifying. And as you'll note, some of the names that we use in the report are not for the actual, are not the real ones for the individuals and we explain and also uh, show that in the report. Uh, we also conducted these interviews in English, and where it needed to be translated, we also had Luganda. We did that to ensure that no information was lost or no voice was lost. Uh, collection of this data was under a tool that is called MATAS. MATAS is a human rights monitoring tool that was designed for human rights defenders to document human rights violations in a very secure way. So that's our database that we use to collect but also store our information. Uh, how did we verify the cases? <coughs> we had interviews with different individuals whom in this particular case we choose to call our clients. We also did a follow-up interview to verify the information that has been given to us. So we'll speak to two or to five people uh, to make sure that we get the right information. We we'll also use police records, uh, articles of the media, uh, written or witness statements, photographs, and all this has been stored in our matters database. May I also mention that the reactors or the researchers also were working as social workers. They could provide counseling, they could provide response, and this response was not only limited to relocation uh, for housing or providing safe transportation or covering of medical bills, expenses, uh, also facilitating pro bono legal work. Just as our safety and protection had mentioned, we work with different partners to help us extend services to our community. Uh, these are like legal aid clinics or lawyers or health facilities that are ready to provide these services to our community. A majority of the crisis response to the documented cases were funded by the International HIV AIDS Alliance under the Rights Evidence Action Program, REACT. Limitations. Funding for crisis response was largely aimed at combating HIV AIDS for men who have sex with men. So there was an over-representation of cases from self-identifying gay men with 80% or 113 of documented cases coming from the gay men. While there were only five cases from transgender women, three cases from transgender men, and 15 cases from lesbian. 
lack of a balanced geographical representation in, the, in this case. Uh, however, cases that arose through any other of 18 SMAG member organizations were reported to SMAG by Uchuru SMAG or the, uh, the LGBT National Security Committee. So I want to say something here. As I was introducing the reactors, I introduced the reactors from our three partners. That was Icebreakers, Spectrum, and Rainbow Health Mbarara. But remember, SMAG has a membership of 18 organizations. So while we're limited with funding, so we couldn't roll out to every member organization to be able to document or send cases to us or have them into the system. So we used the alternative, which was the members who were not implementing the act could reach out to SMAG or the National LGBT Security Committee uh, in that way their cases were responded to or we reached out to them. Around terminology, this report identifies interviewers by the term that clients use to identify themselves and this included gay, bisexual, lesbian, homosexual, transgender, trans, and culture. The former being a localized term in Uganda to describe all sexual and gender minorities. Derogatory terms also appear in this report, which I used to exemplify the verbal abuse that sexual and gender minorities receive in Uganda. A more detailed glossary of the terms used in this report is available in the appendix to the report. Ladies and gentlemen and others, here is a breakdown of the cases. If you're not able to see it clearly, don't worry, it's in the report. And I'll try to quickly go through the cases. So we subdivided the cases under clusters. And these clusters included violence, intimidation, loss of property, and social exclusion. Our violence overall is 27% of cases that we documented. Intimidation amounts for 23% of cases documented. Loss of property uh, amounts to 28% of cases documented. Social exclusion amounts to 22% of cases documented. And again, under each cluster, there is a violation that stands out from all under each. And uh, when you look at under violence, we have over 23 cases as a result of, of arrests. When you go to intimidation, we have 26 cases of non-physical threat and verbal threat. And most of the time this goes unnoticed. People's lives are threatened from neighbors, from colleagues. And people live in fear. And this is something that sometimes, if you want to show proof, you're not going to find it written on someone's face that they were threatened. But people are threatened on daily basis. And most of the times, people are always looking, so who has been beaten? Oh yeah, the chick is stolen, yeah, we can see that. Who has been arrested? Oh yes, they're in police custody. So now we can see the police point. But this continues to be one of the biggest challenges that the community faces. Under loss of property, we have over 24 cases as a result of loss of income and employment. People are fired for being LGBT. I. It means someone's livelihood is totally lost. It means someone's source of income is lost. And it leaves the LGBTI person vulnerable. Under social exclusion, we have over 27 cases as a result of community discrimination and harassment. Where we live, where we work, 
where we party, where we commune, we are discriminated. LGBT people are discriminated. And this is happening. So there is a lot that we need to do. And having given you that breakdown, I'm going to invite my colleague Austin to take us through in detail on each of the clusters that I've just mentioned or talked about. Thank you very much for now. Okay. Okay, so as Richard just mentioned, we broke them down into four different clusters. The first cluster being eviction and loss of property. So um, it, what's interesting about this report is that we it's very unique in the sense that it elevates the stories of LGBTI Ugandans and really showcases the human story. And within that, we have, uh, through analysis, uh, we have seen a lot of different trends emerge within each cluster. So within eviction loss of property, many of the testimonies spoke to the fact that they were forced to leave their homes through either formal evictions by landlords or LCs um, or informal removal by neighbors and community members. These evictions were usually quick, um, leaving LGBTI members with only a few hours or a matter of days to remove all their things and uh, uh, leave the premises. Um, one testimony talked about how their landlord actually padlocked their uh, home and left all of their belongings inside that they couldn't access. So these evictions usually leave LGBTI persons prone to violent attacks. We saw community. Um, obviously correlate to eviction and loss of property because landlords find out about this, community members find out, and then uh, rumors are spread, and they're forced to leave their home. So the next cluster is termination of employment and loss of income. So as Richard mentioned previously, finding work as an LGBTI person in Uganda is extremely difficult. Um, when you do find work, Often the testimony spoke to the fact that they have to remain in the closet and hide their status as a sexual or gender minority in Uganda. Um, living in constant fear that one day they may be outed by their coworkers, family, or community members. We saw a lot of correlation to people who do have jobs with blackmail because when they are outed, they are quickly <coughs> blackmailed as a result. Um, when abuse does happen that relates to termination of employment or loss of income, uh, there's often an extreme fear to ever report the abuse. Almost every case uh, reported or interviewed in this report, uh, most LGBTI individuals never reported it to the police for fear of being outed further or being exposed further to the community. Um, in the report, researchers documented 24 cases of sexual and gender minorities being terminated based on their sexual orientation or gender identity, and in most cases, they also uh, had another form of abuse documented in another cluster. The third cluster was physical threats, violent attacks, and harassment. Um, this is often most frequent for LGBTI individuals whose identities are very outward, and in most cases, documented in the report who were identifying, identifying as transgender women, uh, they experienced physical threat, violent attacks, or harassment. Um, the violence towards LGBTI persons also occurs frequently from fellow members of the LGBT community. This is an interesting trend that hasn't been researched very much and calls for further research. Uh, we Researchers found eight cases of violence towards sexual and gender minorities uh, that were prompted or experienced by peer LGBT members. This is common for LGBT members who are involved in relationships with other LGBT members, and um, it just speaks to the fact that there's also internal abuse and human rights abuses within the community itself. Um, as far as harassment, harassment most frequently takes the form of non-physical, homophobic, or transphobic threats. Um, Almost that's probably that was one of the highest human rights abuses documented, with 26 cases reporting involved verbal harassment, um, while there were nine cases that did involve blackmail, four that involved uh, house intrusion, and 15 involving the loss of physical property. 
the last cluster um, is called We Don't Offer Services to Such People. Um, like the title of the report itself, this is a direct quote from one of the testimonies that an LGBTI person gave to researchers um, after they tried to go to an HIV clinic and were denied uh, access to the services offered by the HIV clinic. So this type of stigma uh, when accessing healthcare for LGBTI individuals is uh, often characterized by extreme stigma as exemplified by the testimonies within the report. Um, it's perhaps one of the most frequent human rights abuses uh, for LGBTI persons uh, out of all of the different types that were outlined in the report. However, the reported cases are very rare. It's one of the lowest we have in the entire report because the normalization of this type of discrimination is so um, rampant and widespread. So many LGBTI individuals don't um, know their rights, which relates to why we, why SMUG has produced a Know Your Rights booklet. Um, many don't understand that they actually have rights to access healthcare, and there are only five documented cases relating to access to healthcare in the report. Thank you very much, Austin. And we now have recommendations from SMUG uh, to different uh, uh, entities. Uh, and we start with uh, recommendations to the government of Uganda. Uh, we are recommending government to stop supporting the cruel and unusual punishment, uh, to also investigate all cases documented. I uh, also further recommend that the Uganda Human Rights Commission and the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights should take proper action for cases documented in this report. Uh, further, we suggest and recommend that the Uganda National HIV AIDS Committee should be inclusive of sexual and gender minorities and include them in all health-related programming. I also recommend that government should decriminalize homosexuality. Further, we are recommending to the international community to assist in investigations on cases represented in this report, assist LGBT refugee, uh, refugees or issues by following or providing protection for LGBT persons seeking asylum, support and needs assessment of LGBT community in Uganda. Uh, we also recommend that help to help hold preparatory of, uh, perpetrators of human rights abuses accountable. I uh, also recommend uh, strengthening capacity in local LGBTI organizations, the international community. To our partners, the civil society, we recommend that you cite this report and use as evidence in work for human rights. We also recommend to locate human rights abuses against LGBTI people in the context of the larger fight for equal rights for all Ugandans. <coughs> we also have recommendations from where we come from, our family. We recommend respect the privacy of LGBTI youth or relatives. Do not discriminate against LGBTI youth or relatives based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. And the reason why we have this emphasis is that from the cases we've documented around banishment and being evicted from homes, we have seen that families are actually abandoning their duty of pro providing protection to their own children just because they're LGBT. To our friends in the media, SMAG recommends respect the privacy of LGBT persons and facts when writing about people or topics that relate to sexuality or gender. We also recommend that the media should or ought to rely on reports and credible information when writing about sexual and gender minorities. 
with all that said and done, we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much our researchers and the reactors for taking us through what the report looks like, the contents of the report. And for you who have been here from the start, I'm sure you've noted some questions, um, comments that you'd like to share with us. So the two people Austin and Richard, they look like they are seated in an executive <laughs> wing, <laughs> but it's actually the hot seat wing, so where they will answer our questions and, you know, whatever concerns we have, but they will also take compliments as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll take about maybe three questions for a start, and then uh, take another round. Please introduce yourself and where you're coming from, and then one question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People know me to be one of those strict moderators, so I will, uh, I think, turn off your mic from my side. <laughs> if I feel you're going overboard. All right, thank you. Uh, Douglas will have the mic. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Theo, Theo Treten. I am with the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, first of all, um, our appreciation um, and congratulations with this uh, extremely important uh, document. Um, we have said it uh, so many times, documentation, documentation, documentation and verification is extremely important uh, to substantiate messages and uh, advocacy. Uh, in that context, I would like to know how this report will be used uh, during the UPR later this year in Geneva. Uh, when the performance of Uganda in terms of human rights uh, will be assessed. Um, I know that there has been, there is work being done in terms of a professional report, uh, civil society, but I'm just wondering, this kind of information, how will it be used in the reporting in Geneva? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Theo. Please, here and then uh, my name is Iris Dill. I come from the GSF Human Rights Project. And um, also my, from my side, thank you very much for that good report and also the booklet, which I think is very necessary. Uh, my question goes to one of your first slides where you stated the over 100 um, cases you received or documented. And I was a bit amazed about the number of um, cases from trans women, which were only five. And I wanted to know, do you have a reason for the low representation of trans women in this? Or Because naturally I would think that the number for trans women would be higher, just because of their physical appearance, or um, already just in the last year I think many more cases have been reported. Um, yeah, is it, is it because of your methodology, or do you have any other reasons for that? Thank you. Thank you. Without, without this knowledge, I, I'm, I'm thinking that if they know the real truth, maybe they will have a different perspective about them. Right, thank you. Let, let's just take one more. Hassan had his hand up, and then we'll have them uh, respond. Uh, mine is just to, com to comment on uh, SMART. And, uh, my name is Hassan Shira. I'm um, from the Defense Defenders Program here at Kampala. To comment on SMART team, and uh, particularly the principal investigator, and other investigators who have really uh, went uh, various parts of the country and also interviewed people uh, who, who are not only numbers, but they are people. So I would be very much appreciative if, if some of the cases 
uh, which you have documented, uh, people could have been highlighted uh, to provide testimony to, to the ongoing, if, that, if that's not jeopardizing their security. And I think the next silver launch will be aimed at that. I thank you very much, Reverend, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. We will take that and then uh, come for another round. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Um, I'll start with uh, the, the one from Hassan, which is a comment, but also uh, seeking information around if we have the testimonies or if we can use these testimonies. Um, I want to say that if you look at the report itself, you're going to be reading and seeing not my image, not Austin's, not uh, any of the reactors that I introduced at the beginning, but direct words from first-hand individuals. And at an opportune time, if we have those who have agreed that some of the information can go public, which includes the identity and name, at the appropriate time, they, we shall be sharing that. But the report has all that information and testaments. Uh, we also had a question from um, Torin around dissemination. And I think you raised a very important uh, issue here, whereby the bigger Uganda seems to be um, not to agree or not to have the right information. And the role of SMAG, uh, we are now 12 years, has been how do we break this message into the message that actually our local Ugandan can understand. We've had hurdles uh, accessing the media and other mediums, but that has not stopped us. And what we are doing is now breaking down and moving down to other, or working together with partners reach out to the greater Uganda and this report is not only being launched in Kampala only but we're going to ensure that other regions or other parts of the country a similar function like this happens to ensure that uh, the greater Uganda gets the message are clearly out there. Um, uh, Theo asked about how will this report be used in the ongoing process of the UPR. We've been working together with partners and we have always been availing ourselves for information and I think this information will be in the report that will be submitted. Um, I'll answer this briefly and then also give a chance to my colleague to answer. Uh, and this was the question around our representation and more so from the trans women community. Uh, just as we had mentioned around limitations, we did identify that there was a gap uh, because one, the biggest source of funding uh, for the project was uh, focusing at MSM. And smug as it is, works broadly. So having identified that gap, uh, this year we are actually now conducting training with trans women so that we have researchers from that community to document cases. And I want to say that next time we invite you for the report, maybe at the same time next year, uh, you'll see that the trans women community is fully represented and other uh, members of the community under the LGBTI. Thank you. So I'll hand over to my colleague. Thank you very much, Richard. Just to add to uh, Richard's response about the UPR, we actually participated in uh, several meetings, consultation meetings, 
and part of this report, part of the information that's in this report is attributed to the report that has been submitted. And hopefully maybe there will be physical, there will be faces to defend uh, the content of the report at the, uh, at the session. Let's take another round. I will, um, no Douglas, we, we first go back and then we come forward. I've noted you, Douglas will come to you after. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Robert Simpala. I work with the uh, uh, Human Rights Network for Journalists Uganda as the national coordinator. And I congratulate you upon this report. Uh, mine is uh, uh, the strategy you employ to engage the media. Um, um, maybe identifying friendly um, uh, partners within the media. Because injustice somewhere is injustice everywhere. Um, it is my very uh, deepest concern that uh, uh, the media has not fully uh, come out to report about these injustices around um, issues like this. So what is your strategy of engagement on this? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Sana Sedik from UNAIDS. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with commending you and thanking you for this brilliant report in uh, an environment like this in Uganda. Um, and thanking you on behalf of the entire UNAIDS for this initiative. My question is, um, how do you think that we can build on this report and this documentation on a bigger national survey for key populations? Thank you. Thank you. Douglas here in front and then there's someone at the back. Um, thank you so much. Judith is my name from the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, looks like we are also having cases of, I don't know whether they're like intimate partner violence among the LGBTI. And I think much as the other, you know, violence issues that are coming from the external can be addressed differently. My question then is how will this inform the work you do? among the LGBTI community to prevent the use of violence among us themselves. Thank you very much. I wish that question was posed to me. <laughs> Behind? I want that question. <laughs> I'm called Olcha Godfrey. I work for local and international media. I would like to know whether, according to your research, the cases of violations are on the rise or on the fall. Thank you. I'll take one more. Over here. Um, <coughs> my name is Amoze Sewadi. I'm representing German proceedings. Now about who, those people who stay employment, how do they survive? Secondly, <laughs> okay, thank you very much for those beautiful, informative questions. Who's taking? Okay, I think I can speak to the last question first about unemployment. Um, many of the testimonies outlined in the report talk about uh, alternative sources of income. Uh, many are driven to uh, engage in uh, sex work to sustain their livelihood. Many uh, become local activists within the LGBT community and find employment that way. Um, basically, uh, just finding different odd jobs or any type of employment that would help them survive. Uh, many work jobs that are sort of within people's homes as maids or whatnot. Um, but there's a diverse array, obviously, of different types of ways people can get employment, and they are, in some of the testimonies, they speak to that within the report. Thank you very much, Austin. Um, uh, to, the, to the question of other cases of violation on the rise or downfall, um, I think, just as our idealist says, Uganda is like weather. 
you wake up in the morning, it's bright, and before you know it, it's raining. <laughs> so, and even at the beginning of our presentation of the overview, we're very clear and say that even when the anti-homosexuality law is nullified, which would have meant a breather or relief to LGBTI persons, we have continued to see uh, cases of human rights violations against LGBTI people. So you can never know when, whether down the rise or downfall, but one thing that is very clear is that violations are still ongoing. Uh, how will this inform our work that we do? Pepe wanted to jump on this and answer it, but I'm going to ask how does this report inform? Uh, one thing I want to say is that this report clearly shows us that advocacy works. The advocacy that SMAG has been doing for the last 12 years does work. And we have been working uh, heavily are engaging different stakeholders in the Ministry of Health, in Parliament, put a lot of emphasis too, without leaving anyone behind. Uh, there's a question around how this report build into a national survey like for key populations and provide information. Uh, one I must say is that just as we, at the beginning of the report, we said the project was having a heavy hand of funding on men who have sex with men. And we have identified that population. But SMAG also works on a broader way. And we see that issues are raised. And it clearly shows cases from Western Uganda, cases from uh, Central or Kampala for the monitor to be open because for me at that time the public voice had been raped and that's how we feel about the media you're a big ally so let's continue engaging and SMAG is ready to engage just as we have recommended and also mentioned in the report around cases of IVP just as my colleague Austin did mention, intimate partner violence is for real even under the LGBT community. And that's why we felt important to mention it in our report, saying that it's not only them. You know, most of the times we like to point, but we forget that this finger is actually pointing at you. Or four are actually pointing at you. So this report highlights that, and we're saying things need for more research and more emphasis of ensuring that IPV does not prevail in any community in Uganda, regardless of your sexual orientation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. If we don't have more, is there one more burning question? <laughs> Mr. Serawaji, you've remembered your question? Yes, I've remembered. Okay, we'll take that and then we'll continue with the, uh, with the remarks. Uh, why are the uh, LBT being refugees? refugees? Have you smuggled them out of the LBT? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question to stop with, to end the <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think as we all smile and laugh, it's a very serious issue. When the anti homosexual laws passed by Parliament on the 20th of December 2013, there was a dark cloud on this nation. And the storm did not stop. It continued when the president on the 24th of February signed the AHA into a law. We have seen a huge exodus 
of LGBT individuals who have left the country because of persecution. And as we all know, seeking asylum or, ref or refuge, no one does it for you. It's a personal decision. The other night, Mr. who is here. And uh, the only things I was left to know is that the report launch will be there. Are you in the country? And I said, yes, I'm in the country. And then you'll be invited formally by email. So I got it, I confirmed, I put in my calendar, and I came. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but one thing now I want to take this opportunity is that, first of all, I, I follow the same protocol. Uh, Frank has followed all protocols, expect fully observed. I know many colleagues here, uh, donors, friends, from, from Netherlands, from UK, from, from other places, and also the, the manager of the office of the High Commissioner here, my, my brother, Dr. Ojena. <coughs> so, and also civil society leaders, uh, including <coughs> the journalist leaders and others. First of all, my greetings to you all. Now, I think I will borrow a word so uh, evidence, the thing is the evidence now. Or oh, evidence is a thing. Quite so often, LGBTI persons, either because of the fear, general fear, or because of not really wanting to come. Who, who, want, who want to come out a place where even you can lose your life? They were silently suffering about these violations. Not speaking out, not properly documented, but I'm so happy to see that SMAP, which is a very founding member, I always mention that, of the, our network, is able to survive in this train. I know these leaders, the risk they put in their lives, but not only that, but become a very active and vocal voice for the community. Without this map, without leaders now who spoke in front of you, I think the global human rights community could not have ever known about what's happening in this country. And because of that effort, and diplomats and statesmanship, they conducted their advocacy, not emotional. I, I really enjoy when I see Frank and Beppe and Dance in an highly high class, or what you call top-notch uh, meetings with head of states and others, the appeal, I've never heard them saying that, cut money from Uganda, I've never heard them. They always say that, my grandma, my, my, my auntie, my niece, my nephew, are part of Uganda, myself. You don't need to cut, I mean, critical support for our health, for our school. The launch of this report is aimed at providing um, evidence on the violation of LGBT persons in Uganda. This is to show that there is persecution of LGBT persons. It has been very hard to prove because often people get harassed, people get beaten, but many Ugandans have said, you know, it is a, it is a, it is a crime to be a, an LGBT person in Uganda, so why should you complain about it? And when you go and explain that the uh, violation of human rights of LGBT persons does take place. It is often denied or refused. But providing data and information is further to show that the persecution is indeed taking place. Thank you very much. The persecution of LGBT persons happens. People get arrested. People get charged with arbitrary arrest. With the arbitrary, uh, people get arbitrary arrests. People get charged with all sorts of charges. And then, when you reach court, you cannot provide evidence. Because, like I said, if two people are consenting, there's no you can provide evidence. And also, Chris Muviru, the first charges were on forced sexual acts. So, in a way, our courts have been very clear on consenting adults. Because Chris's charges were very clear on uh, forced sexual acts, which we condemn. We condemn sexual exploitation of any kind. We condemn sexual acts on any person. We condemn sexual exploitation of young people. But Chris's charges were mainly on sexual acts, but not on two consenting adults and sexual orientation or gender identity. Okay. Can you have that in Uganda? Oh, so that does not count as evidence. 
So everyone had the same answer for us. All that is here say we need concrete evidence if you guys want us to deal with what you're talking about. And so we went back to the drawing board. And today, you cannot tell us that there is no evidence. Because we have evidence of violations, we have evidence of health issues, we have come up with all the statistics that count. Be it in health, be it with police arrests, be it with violations, with evictions, with job loss, we have the data, we have the evidence. No one can tell us anymore that we need the evidence. And this to happen in Uganda, just over 10 years, since everyone thought it could not be done. I think it is very important for us to say congratulations to the team at SMAG, and I would like us to put our hands together for Frank and his team at Session members. It is not an easy task. Uganda is a very funny place for sexual minorities, like we all know. Carrying out evidence-based research in a country like this comes with a lot of bottlenecks. Everyone looks at you suspiciously. Everyone who cooperates with you is actually taking a risk because they might also be suspected of being gay because they are cooperating with your research or with your study. So it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of convincing. You have to put in like three times the energy a normal researcher would put in just to get data about violations, just to get an opinion of a local leader, or just to get space, like 10 minutes of a religious leader listening to you. You have to chase that for about six months. So when SMAG comes up with a post like this, it is not something that happened overnight. It is a lot of work put in it. And like the speaker after me will testify, it's been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming, even for hotels to allow us to present reports like this. Over time, I have met so many people who actually work around human rights, who testify that they have seen human rights violations. I've seen people dedicated to human rights work. I've seen people who have put in sleepless nights and long days to make sure that human rights in Uganda and all over the world are promoted and protected. I've not met so many people who I can say have the passion for this cause like the person I'm going to invite after me. I'm very proud to be able to call him a friend, to call him a mentor. He is the executive director of the Eastern Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. He's a Pan-Africanist. He's a friend. He's a father. He's, he's everything good. To Abagara na ngabali bavili ati nga bakulu. Sio kafe nga tuvo milia echo korachyo na echo kako muntu. Echo korachyo na echi ingiza echo kwa taba na batu. Echo korachyo na echo kako muntu nga tayagala echo tuche familia nyo. Atechi omusangu guna wakwa kuso mbiru echi rache gulaga nti abantu baku ati wanyo mumisangu. Nebatu wali wa mkoti, nebatu wali wa mkomera na ye obujulizi. Tebusobe <laughs> Finally, 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 finally.